Okay. Good, thanks. Hi, I'm Todd Lefko, and I'm chairperson of the Russian American Business and Culture Consult. We welcome you on behalf of, uh, of our co-sponsors, Global Minnesota, which has been, is, and shall continue to be Minnesota's connection to the world. The Museum of Russian Art, the major Russian museum in North America, and thankfully located here in Minnesota. And the Russian American Business and Culture Council, which has become the preeminent citizen diplomacy organization relating Americans to the former Soviet Union. I would also like to thank our technical genius, Sergei Kuznetsov, and Michael Wright, whom you meet later, who made this program possible. It's our honor to host one of America's foremost journalists, Marvin Kalb. To introduce Mr. Kalb and to moderate tonight, we are pleased to have our friend Mark Ritchie, president of Global Minnesota. So Mark, thank you. Thank you very much, Todd, and welcome to all who have joined us tonight for this very important program. Could not have been more, I would say, uniquely timed uh, given all of the publicity, all the international attention. And so we're tonight going to hear from one of the true giants of American journalism, but also of America's role in the world. Our guest this evening and our um, really esteemed leader in journalism and media in the United States, Marvin Kelb, uh, has served around the planet in so many different ways and so many different mediums. His uh, sort of early days were his moment of being one of, I believe, the last of the so-called Murrow boys being joining the team with Edward R. Murrow at the end of that era when television and news was really becoming part of the daily life of the American people. And it was quite an experience for his. In a number of his books and articles, he has chronicled some of those eras in American life developing. We have the great honor of having him this evening because he has been continuing to give us analysis and vision about what's happening in the world. And tonight we'll be uh, concentrating on what's going on in the region of Ukraine and Russia. And this is a topic of great interest. But I think the lessons of his life's work and his lesson of his keen and very, very experienced ability to see and analyze will give us a broader perspective to think about ourselves, ourselves individually, ourselves in our community, ourselves as a nation in this planet. One of the things that I have appreciated in my life was a very special book that he got to write with his daughter, Deborah Kelb. I was so envious and a little jealous that you had that opportunity. But Haunting Legacy, Vietnam and American Presidency was a classic, a true genius work of analyzing decision-making about one of the foreign policy issues that was central to the life of the nation and to many in the nation, uh, Vietnam. And that way of taking the talent of the day-to-day -day observation and putting it into a context to help us do a better job in the future. We are gonna remain humans, frail, faulty, ambitious, sometimes generous, we are going to remain human, but we have the human story presented to us by people like Marvin Kelb that can help us do a better job of leaving a better place for those that come behind us. It's my pleasure to introduce our tonight's speaker and to hand the microphone over to you. Thank you, Marvin Kelb. Well, thank you very, very much, all of you for inviting me tonight. Um, it's a little later here in Washington than it is where you guys are, or most of you are. Um, it is my pleasure to be here, and that kind of introduction leaves me a bit in awe. I consider myself very much just a journalist, um, a writer, and I'd like to talk to you tonight, or at least start our discussion with a book that I wrote that recently came out called Assignment Russia. Um, being a reporter covering Russia in the midst of the Cold War, way back in 1960. And this is part of a trilogy. 
um, several years ago, probably about 10 years ago, at dinner at home, we were sitting around the table and I was telling a story about my experiences with Nikita Khrushchev, who was the leader of the Soviet Union back between 1954 and 1964. And one of my two daughters said, Daddy, you know what you ought to do? You ought to put that into a book. I said, I'm too busy. They said, no, 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 you're never too busy to write a book. And they're right, I love to write books. <clears throat> and I asked the publisher at Brookings whether they'd be interested in the story of an American reporter, very young at that time, <laughs> covering Khrushchev's Russia, 1956-7 for the first book. It was called The Year I Was Peter the Great, which is an interesting story I'll tell you about. The second book, the one I'll talk about tonight, is called Assignment Russia. It's from 1957 to 61. And the third book in this trilogy, which I'm about halfway finished now, I'm not quite sure of the title, but it might be Nikita and Me Covering Khrushchev's Russia. So let me start by just saying, I was privileged as a journalist to be able to cover and get to know three figures in our history. Um, one of them was Edward R. Murrow, great journalist, the man who hired me at CBS. The other one was Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union. And the third, John F. Kennedy, the president of the United States. Um, and at a time when Kennedy and Khrushchev met over the barrel of what could have been a nuclear war over control of Cuba. But I want to start back in 1956. I was then at the US Embassy serving as a translator, interpreter, a kind of news attache. And um, on July 3rd in the evening, our ambassador, Charles Bolin, who was an absolutely extraordinarily good, thoughtful, wonderful ambassador, great representative of the people of the United States, spoke fluent Russian, got a call from the foreign ministry saying, Khrushchev and his entire Politburo want to come to the embassy tomorrow, the July 4th party, and pay their respects. Ooh. Bolden knew immediately this was a big deal. The problem was he only had three other people at the embassy who spoke Russian. I was one of them, but I was the kid on the block, as you can imagine. And the ambassador said, Marvin, you are to look after Marshal Zhukov, who was the Minister of Defense, great World War II hero. I said, yes, but you know, when I was in the army, I was only a PFC. There's something wildly cockeyed about a PFC looking after a Soviet marshal. And the ambassador said, I have no one else to do it. So I read up a great deal that night on Zhukov. One thing that stuck in my mind is that he was a great drinker. He loved his vodka. So I got a hold of the butler at Spasso House where the ambassador lived and where the party was going to be. And I said, Tong, do me a favor. When you serve vodka, serve vodka on the left side so that Marshal Zhukov will reach and get his vodka that way. On the right side of the tray, make sure it's water, which he did. So Khrushchev arrived with Zhukov and the others that was my first face-to-face -face with, uh, with, uh, with Khrushchev. And he was what I had expected, a buoyant, bubbly, um, very nationalistic, totally devoted communist. And he looked up at me and he said, um, young man, how tall are you? And I don't know why I said this, but I did. I said, I'm three centimeters shorter than Peter the Great. At which point he burst into laughter. And when a dictator laughs, everybody around him laughs. So 
everybody was laughing. And he said, have you ever played basketball? I said, yes. And he said, you know, we have the greatest basketball team here in the Soviet Union. And again, I don't know why I said it, but I did. I said, sir, with all due respect, a very good college team in the, in the United States could beat your best team. Khrushchev's eyes flashed, he was angry, at which point Bolin jumped in and said, why don't we have a drink? And that was my time to sit down with Malchi Zhukov. He had eight, I counted them, eight rumki, um, small glasses of vodka, belted each one of them back. I belted eight waters back. And then Zhukov looked at me, he was getting a bit tipsy. And he said to me, you seem to be in good shape. You had eight vodkas. Not lying, I said I had eight drinks. He assumed that meant vodka. We got into a conversation then with Khrushchev and he was and remained in my mind an extraordinary figure and I wanted to know more about him. The next of these three people I wanna talk about, Murrow. Um, after finishing my assignment for the State Department in Moscow, 1957, I went back to Harvard going off my PhD, Russian history, I taught Russian history. I had the language down. And because of my time in Moscow, I spoke it really quite well. Um, and I wrote an article about Soviet youth, which appeared in the New York Times Magazine. And um, I was in Widener Library on a Monday. This article appeared in Sunday Magazine. And um, the librarian comes over to me, taps me on the shoulder, and she said, there's a man on the phone who says he's Edward R. Murrow. <laughs> I looked at her and I said, he's probably some quack. Hang up on him, Murrow's not calling me. I don't know whether she did hang up on him. And I went back to doing my work and late in the afternoon, she's back, shoulder tap. Marvin, she said, he's back on the phone. He says he's Edward R. Murrow. Would you at least talk to him? And I realized that I, that was sort of silly attitude that I had. So I picked up the phone the instant I heard that magnificent voice. I said to myself, Marvin, you are one total jackass. And I began to apologize profusely. He said, no, 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 stop it. He said, can you be in my office tomorrow at 9 a.m.? I said, where are you? He said, New York. I said, I'll be there. Got on the train, got, obviously got there in plenty of time, put on a proper shirt, tie, uh, and was there at nine o'clock. Secretary says, this tomorrow is extremely busy. Um, you've only got 30 minutes, that's it. I said, yes, ma'am. And I went in and Murrow and I spoke for three hours. And the, and the conversation was broken up early when the secretary came in and said, Ed, you have a lunch date you've got to get to. Murrow was intensely interested in everything having to do with the Soviet Union. He wanted to know about young people, religion, books that they read, relationship with parents, grandparents, the role of money, uh, school, all kinds of things. And I kept referring to him as sir, and he kept calling me professor, which was a little above my rank. And um, that, by the way, was the relationship we had until Ed died in 1964. Um, Murrow had in mind, when we finished our conversation, he tapped me on the shoulder and said, Marvin, how would you like to join CBS? And it took me about two seconds to say yes. And that was the end of my career as a scholar and the beginning of my career as a journalist, but I could, I think, meld the two of them together later on in life. Um, Murrow was the sort of man 
who was touched by the pre-World War II experience in Germany. He told me one story I want to tell you. 1935, he met a wonderful German family with three kids, wife, husband, whom he had met first. They went to the theater together. They went to concerts together. They talked about books they had read, um, not together, but they had read and they discussed. And Morrow said they were the finest people he had ever met. And he wanted to continue to see them. So every time he returned to Germany, he would call. And on one of his visits, in the tail end of 1938, after an event called Kristallnacht, uh, when the Nazis ripped apart um, synagogues, Jewish stores, uh, Jewish homes, whatever they could find. And Murrow, before he knew about that, but he was certain that when he went to this family, they would be for him what Germany had represented earlier to him. And when he went into the house, knocked on the door, and the door opened. The husband was there in a Nazi uniform. And Murrow said that they, he came in, he had dinner, but he said it was totally different. And after that, he kept asking himself, not just how can a person change so dramatically in three years, but how could a nation change so dramatically? in three years. When Senator McCarthy began to attack innocent people, accusing them in the early 1950s of being communists, Murrow went, in his mind, went back to thinking about Germany and how people can change and how therefore nations can change and that we had to be alert to any threat to two issues that he regarded as fundamental to democracy. One of them is what he called the sacred law, sacred law. And the other he called freedom of the press. And he regarded both of these ideas as pillars on which you can place democracy. And he stressed that democracy is a word. It can be a word of meaning if you vest it with certain values, or it can just be a large word with very little meaning. But the meaning he gave to democracy was that if you have the law and if you have a free, vibrant press, you have a very good chance of having and maintaining democracy. And that to me was a story about Murrow. We could go into much more later. Khrushchev, talk about him for a little bit. I've already told you the kind of humorous story, but there was a part of Khrushchev which had to be understood. A lot of Americans remember him as the Russian leader who came to the UN, took off his shoe and banged it on the table in order to get attention. And then he was a fool and he shouldn't do that. Uh, he was one of the most cunning fools I had ever covered. He was, as I said earlier, an extremely devoted communist. He believed that communism, if it ran well, and he believed it does run well, little problems here and there, but it does, can accomplish miracles. It can produce apartments for every family. It can produce food for everybody. It can produce more than anything, peace. When I arrived for the first time in Russia, and I have lived there now for almost six years and been back dozens of times since then. When I arrived at the beginning of 1956, it was only 11 years after the end of World War II. During World War II, the Russian people lost somewhere between 20 and 40 million people. 
in the course of that war. 20 to 40 million. Every Russian family was touched by it in one way or another. When I arrived, the total population of Russia was about 160 million. So think about that for a sec and that casualty rate. Everybody was touched with it. Every city was ripped up. Moscow was still a scarred metropolis. Um, and in Khrushchev's mind, what was fundamental was peace. And during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he showed the world that he tolerated the humiliation he faced when he withdrew his missiles from Cuba after having tried to sneak them in past Kennedy and past American planes, intelligence operations, Khrushchev made a terrible mistake. When he was caught, he had the guts, though humiliated, he had the guts to pull those missiles out. Two years later, he was out of power. But he had the guts to do that. Why? Because he did not want to see the world collapse into a nuclear war with millions of people being killed. He said, I heard him say quite a few times, the living will envy the dead if there's a war. Think about that phrase. The living will envy the dead. And so he wanted very much to avoid it. And he was prepared to do something that very few political leaders, communists or otherwise, would do. And it was at the heart of it all, a determination in his mind to give his system of, of, um, of policy, the communist system, an opportunity to do its magic. It never did. It was in fact a dreadful, political and economic system. And it collapsed because it was so bad. But he believed in it. And it was remarkable to cover him and to see him go, he was mercurial in terms of his personality. He'd go from being very angry to being a bunch of laughs. He also had a terrific sense of humor. Um, and he loved, by the way, Western jokes, which you then, you, you tell him the joke and then you had to explain it to him after you told it to him. He was fascinated by this young American president. He was fascinated by him, but he didn't at the very beginning have a great deal of respect for him. The first time he met him was in 1959, up on Capitol Hill, when Khrushchev was doing a, a visit, a, a three week visit to the United States. And he was up on the hill and he met a number of senators, among them, Senator Kennedy. And when he looked at him, what stuck in his mind was so young, he has to be so inexperienced. One day, I may take him to the cleaners. That was his thought in 1959. And throughout 1960, wherever it was that he went, when he would see me, he would beckon, Peter the Great, come over here. And I go, and he says, what's going on in the United States? What did the polls say? <laughs> he wanted to know in the same way that any politician would want to know, and you turn to the polls to find out. And I would tell him, I don't know. You've got an ambassador there, find out, let me know. But he was always asking me these questions because in the back of his mind, there was something not only that he could take him to the cleaners, but he came from a very, very rich family. Millionaire, he would say. Millionaire is just the worst thing you could possibly be for a communist in the capitalist world. 
So he was sort of looking forward to the opportunity of meeting him if he won the election. And when Kennedy did win, Khrushchev, one of the first things he did was typically Khrushchev. First, he released a bunch of American pilots who had mistakenly been brought down by the Russians um, in the northwestern corner of the Soviet Union. And he released them. Uh, no conditions here, there they are. Didn't ask for anything back. And Kennedy liked that. And Khrushchev wanted to make a gesture to him. But at the same time, he put out the text of a speech that he had delivered on January 6th, 1961, in which he said, he doesn't want to have a nuclear war, doesn't want to have a major war, but he cannot control, he said, wars of national liberation, such as the kind currently underway in Southeast Asia. And he mentioned Laos and he mentioned Vietnam. Kennedy, reading that January 6th speech, was so impressed that he read it two or three times and had his senior staff read it two or three times because Kennedy felt that he had in there the core of Khrushchev's thinking of his mind. And he wanted very much to know what Khrushchev was thinking. When the two of them met in Vienna in June of 1961, it was after the disastrous Bay of Pigs operation in Cuba, which gave Khrushchev additional reason to believe he could take this young man to the cleaners. They met for two days in Vienna. And I must tell you this story, I still to this day find it fascinating because it says so much about Khrushchev as a man, but also as an opponent. The first conversations took place in the Russian embassy, the second in the American embassy. Kennedy's back was killing him that day and he was seated. The doors open up and Khrushchev walks in. Kennedy stood up to shake his hand and sat down very quickly. When the meeting was over, and it was a terrible meeting having to do with Vietnam, having to do with Cuba, having to do especially with Berlin. And Khrushchev, when he walked out, turned immediately to two or three of his aides, poked them with his elbow and said, did you see what I saw? And they didn't know quite what the boss meant. He said, when Nikita Sergeyevich walked into that room, did you notice the way that young millionaire stood up? He stood up when Nikita Sergeyevich walks into the room. Number one, he had no knowledge of simple courtesy. He had no knowledge of protocol. He didn't understand that Kennedy was doing nothing special, but that confirmed in his mind that he could take him to the cleaners. And that led directly in to the Berlin crisis, which almost immediately led into the Cuban missile crisis. In a few minutes here, what I would like to do now is simply give you um, two points. One of them is looking back on the Khrushchev era, which is something I'm trying to do now in this third book. Khrushchev was, as I said before, a devoted communist. He was also a Russian nationalist. What does that mean exactly? All nationalists believe in their country, in the greatness of their country. But with the Russians, it's a little different. 
it isn't the kind of nationalism that you find in the United States or in France, um, Germany. It is a nationalism that blends not only the nation, but the land and the religion into a troika of belief. And you have to have that troika in order to understand deep down what they told the Russian soul. When people try to find out now, what is Putin doing in Ukraine? He is similar to Khrushchev in that respect. His Russian soul is very similar to Khrushchev's. And I think that if you know one, you know the other. And Khrushchev led a country for 10 years that was first coming out of the depths of a war of deep economic insecurity, political insecurity, military insecurity. And he began to pull those things together by the threads of Russian nationalism, not communism, nationalism. The communism was sort of embroidery. It was um, a thing that you put on top to give it some kind of intellectual structure. But for the Russian nationalists, you don't need a structure, you need a soul. And Khrushchev did a great deal to help Russia. And the second point, I'd like to leave you with is that Gorbachev. Gorbachev was most influenced in his young years by the reforms that Khrushchev had inaugurated. And if Russia had the ability to think, uh, <laughs> I'm going to say something that you have to be a Westerner to do, to think in a logical way. The Russian people would have embraced Gorbachev. He was trying to bring them economic and political freedom and opportunity within the framework of Russian nationalism and a strong Russian state. But they didn't give him the opportunity because the Russians appear to need somebody uh, with more. Um, determination to lean on the use of Russian power in order to reach out and acquire the respect of the, of the Western world. Putin wants respect, um, but he wants it on his terms. And it is at the moment an extremely interesting but dangerous time that we all face. I would be extremely happy to take any kind of question that you have, even questions that relate to the New York Yankees. I'm a great fan. Uh, but whatever you wish to do now, I'm in your hands, fire away. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking us through history and stories and into the minds of several of the most important people, at least I know in my life. Um, Michael Wright and Todd Lefko, join me, uh, please there on the stage, on the screen. And we have a first question posted. Do you think Putin believes he can take Biden to the cleaners? I don't think that Putin thinks in those terms. Khrushchev was um, a man with limited formal education. Um, Putin had the best that the Soviet Union could provide in education and it was refined um, through the KGB uh, background as well. So there are two different minds here, but they, they come together 
as examples of a high form of Russian nationalism. And Putin is very cautious. He does not want to test Biden too much. I believe he felt he could have taken him to the cleaners, but now believes that he cannot. Now sees a NATO that is essentially unified in a way that it hasn't been for quite a while. What he's done in Ukraine by threatening Ukraine, by already taking a piece like Crimea off in 2014, by allowing Donbass to be moved off. He has um, created a new Ukraine, a Ukraine that feels threatened and a Ukraine that has developed in the last 20 years, a new, fresh, strong form of nationalism. And the Ukrainians today, not all of them, but a good number of them, will fight the Russians and fight them to their deaths because um, Putin's made a terrible mistake. First in this reading, Biden, second in this reading, the Ukrainians. Thank you. I wanna jump in with a question that's uh, based a little bit on your answer. You were talking about differences between Khrushchev and Putin. When I was quite young, Khrushchev came and visited Iowa, where I was, as did the Pope. And it was a pretty interesting experience to be there. And there's a wonderful book, Khrushchev in Iowa. Putin's never come to uh, other parts of the US like that. But do you think there was something in that time when you were covering Khrushchev that closely that was influential about the fact that he came beyond New York and Washington uh, to see and meet more of the American people. Absolutely. Uh, that is another side of Khrushchev that has to be stressed. He was very, very curious. He was fascinated by the West. One of the reasons I think he took to me at all when I mentioned Peter the Great was that in his mind, Peter the Great was the first czar who set foot outside of the czarist empire. Where did he go? He went to the West. He traveled around for several months. Uh, everybody knew who he was, but he traveled around not as a czar, but as first a fisherman, then he was a carpenter. He was a worker because he was fascinated by the West and he wanted very much to take the best of the West and bring it to Russia. That was what Khrushchev wanted to do. Putin, however, because he runs a more advanced Russia than Khrushchev ran, Putin does not believe he has to take anything from the West. He is, he's not fascinated by the West, he's angry at the West. He believes that the West is a negative force. The West has to do with democracy, which he regards as a passe uh, philosophy. They're two very different people in many ways. There is a question in the question chat. I see there's some coming in two different ways. What does Russia have to gain by invading Ukraine or is it just to prevent NATO from arming Ukraine and expanding military bases? Well, what it has to gain is the pulling together of the essential parts of the Slavic nation. When a Russian nationalist uses the word Slavic, what he has in mind in national terms is Russia, then Belarus, and Ukraine. Last summer, Putin put out a document which was his reading of the Russian-Ukrainian relationship. And he said that we are one people, we are one religion, 
we are one language, we are one nation. It's a tricky phrase when you talk about one nation and you may invade that nation and kill your own people. That is, he's lifted a, a lid there on a very sensitive issue. And he must have known what he was doing. He's a very smart guy. And I haven't figured out yet what, how he's going to handle that if in fact he's going to invade Ukraine at all. He wants Ukraine back because he thinks he owns it. Not he personally, but the Russian nation cannot exist unless it is connected organically and politically with Belarus and Ukraine. And so he talks about NATO and, and, he, and he certainly doesn't want Ukraine into NATO, but he doesn't want it in NATO, not in an abstract sense, but because that would confirm that Ukraine has left the Slavic nation and has joined the West. That's to, put, to Putin that is unacceptable. And I fear he will not he will do all kinds of things to make sure that does not happen. Just a, a quick question, you know, from a, in the earlier part of our discussion, you were talking about uh, people seeming to be uh, kind of overly anxious about wanting to have uh, a, a throwdown with Russia in this circumstances. Is there a role for citizen diplomacy now between uh, Russia and America? The, you know, the behind the scenes conversations that's just people to people? Um, and if so, the follow on is, can journalists help that? <laughs> um, the answer on uh, the second part is absolutely yes. Um, and let me tell you about the first, you're talking to somebody who is a great fan of person to person diplomacy, and you can even drop the word, the fancy word diplomacy, just person to person. Um, something I learned from Murrow. If you want to be a good reporter, you have to know the people you're dealing with and you're covering. Uh, then know them, speak their language, know their literature, know their history, respect them. You don't have to give them anything that you consider vital to your own interest, but respect them. And my experience in Russia, as I said, I lived there for quite a few years and have been back and forth many, many times. My experience with the Russians is that they want to be, they really want to be told the truth, level with them. You'll find if you level with the Russian, he may not like what you're saying, and he'll let you know that he doesn't like what you're saying but he will respect and honor you for saying it because you have demonstrated to him that you respect him enough to tell him even something negative. And my feeling is that in 19, I can't, I'm sorry, give you an exact date now, but it's probably in the mid sixties when cultural relations between Russia and the United States picked up ahead of steam. And I remember, no, back in the 50s, I remember that Porgy and Bess was brought to the Soviet Union. They produced, they had productions of Porgy and Bess, I think in 11 cities, they went all over the Soviet Union. It was a phenomenal success. And the people, the performers themselves, um, enjoy at the beginning, enjoyed very much being and meeting with Russians. I say at the beginning because after a while, after a while, the KGB began to do stupid things, hounding uh, the actors when they went after a performance, it was late at night, and the KGB probably thought they were going to go back into that immediately, where they didn't want to. They wanted to go out for a walk, they wanted to have a drink, whatever, and talk until two in the morning. 
Well, the KGB made this extremely difficult for a lot of them. They didn't like it. So they, in effect, were saying the hell with you, I'm going home. But they had to finish. So, and then we brought in, I remember when Isaac Stern um, um, came the first time, Isaac was born in, the, in Russia. He spoke Russian. And so when he was introduced and he came out on stage in the Tchaikovsky Conservatory, in the central part off the Arbat in Moscow, and he had his fiddle with him and he was about to play something, he announced what he was going to play in Russian. That sort of blew the walls down of suspicion, whatever, and they just embraced him. And I found myself traveling around in 1956, it was very rare that an American, and at that time I was at the embassy, uh, that an American official would be traveling out to Central Asia. And I went through all of the stands, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all of them, and tried to do the same thing with uh, total strangers that I had done in Moscow and Leningrad and Kiev. That is, smile, be kind to them, ask them what they do, uh, be respectful. And they were difficult at the beginning, but then they opened up. And I found that the Russians, after an initial period of skepticism and suspicion, um, if you handle it well, uh, you can make lifelong friends though. And journalists can help, absolutely. <laughs> well, there's a journalist question, which is, could Ed Murrow exist in a digital age of journalism? How would Murrow advise us to get our news now? And what is your own practice of digesting the daily news? Wow, that is a, that is what I would call a hardball question. <laughs> uh, I think that Murrow would, and probably has many times, rolled over in his grave, watching what goes for television news today. I think he would be shocked. However, we must bear in mind that in a Chicago speech that he did in 1958, he talked about a test that he was running, actually somebody on his behalf, that you watch television for 24 hours on American television. You watch it for 24 hours, seven days in a row. And then you present your findings on what has been, what is it that you've watched? Seven days in a row, 24 hours a day. And Mo said, you, you find, a lot of laughs, a lot of tears, um, soap opera, weather, sports, occasionally a news bullet. You don't know anything about the world, he said, after this kind of test, based on what you watch in 1958 on American television. What would he be seeing today, 50, 60 years later? As I said, he, he would be extremely unhappy. What do I do? I'm sorry to say this, but I watch, I watch less news today, but I read more news today. And I watch it less because I'm saddened by what I see and what I hear. There are very good journalists around today, very good. I applaud every single one of them, but they are working in an environment which fights their natural instinct to go get the news and explain that some things that are happening are complicated. You need time to explain it. It is not simply a headline. But I fear that that is essentially what we are. We are 
now increasingly educated on the basis of headlines. And when we come to something as dangerous as Ukraine today, as dangerous as what might happen on an island called Taiwan, um, are we prepared for that? If we have to fight, do we know what we're fighting for? Above and beyond cliches and you know, we must give Ukraine the right um, to choose NATO membership. Well, NATO is not considering Ukraine at this point, but the argument is, does Ukraine have the right? Okay, once you have said, sure, she's got the right, what have you accomplished? You're still left with Russian desires to control and dominate Ukraine. So we are called upon as as citizens, not just journalists, we'll call them out as citizens, to dig a little more deeply into the problems that we face, read a little bit more. I'm not preaching, uh, do whatever you like. But if we are to cope sensibly with the complex problems that we face today, starting with the pandemic, and then going on to political polarization. Isn't it amazing? I mean, ask yourself this question. Isn't it amazing that 52%, 52% of the American people believe there was something wrong with the 2020 election of President Biden? More than half of the American people have lost faith in the validity of a free election. What does that say? When did this issue arise? It arose big time after the 2020 campaign and leading into the 2020 campaign and immediately after and Trump lost. That is when this question arose about the elections. Are we not capable of thinking this through? Do we just so quickly go with the word of a former president? I find this amazing. I love this country. I've traveled all over the world. I've covered everything, wars, whatever. And I always want to come home because this is great. This is a great place. This was a, a great country for, for me, for my, my brother, sister, parents, uncle, aunt, whatever. But there are times I don't recognize it now. Where's it gone? Where's my country gone? One of the questions was related to how others are seeing us as Americans, as the United States. You're traveling, you've been around the world. What are you seeing as our reflection out in the world? It very much depends on who the president is, and it very much depends on the effect that the president's policy has on this country because whether we like it or not, the world is now very small, everything is covered live. Whatever happens here is known in Beijing instantly. Uh, so when President Obama, for example, went into Germany in, in 2010, um, <laughs> You could not get within miles of him. It was that jammed up with humanity. Uh, he was regarded in the 90 something percentile of affection and understanding by, by the people in Germany. When President Trump went, it had dropped down to 27%. In not only its feelings about Trump, but in its respect 
and admiration for the United States. The second very large issue has to do with democracy. We had always been upheld by people all over the world as the citadel of democracy, the place where you can go to find out how this thing works. And um, I don't want to say that it's all Trump because it started before Trump, but he gave it a push down that has opened up questions about the solidity of American democracy. And once again, more than 50% of the American people have questions today about democracy and what it is, what it represents and whether we are a democracy. That, that is again, you know, you, you talk, you, the words come out and you say something and there are, Fire away. Thank you so much, Marvin. Uh, just uh, an absolutely delightful hour. And we promised that we would stay to an hour. So uh, just can't thank you enough. Uh, the extremely thought provoking and uh, informative. Certainly your experiences in life have really informed uh, how you see things. And I think it uh, behooves all of us to take the time to reflect. You know, you brought up a very interesting thing about synchronous communication. And the problem is we only do it with short things and uh, it makes our decisions kind of circumspect. You know, they're too quick. That's um, right, they are. Complexity. But uh, you're spending time like this and reflecting on uh, your history and uh, all the different players that you've met and how that's informed your thinking uh, is hopefully informed ours tonight. Um, we'd also like to, you know, thank Mark Ritchie, president of uh, Global Minnesota, for hosting and leading us through this um, and taking your questions. And uh, Todd, I'll turn it over to you and uh, thank you, uh, RABC, for the the uh, sponsorship along with Global Minnesota, and for Marvin for answering my emails. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Listen, thank you, and especially thank you to those of you that tune in tonight. The program is recorded and it'll be on the websites for the sponsoring organizations for, um, for both ours and for uh, Global Minnesota. Um, please look at the websites for upcoming events. When, we were sitting, when I was sitting as a graduate student in Murphy Hall, which is the journalism department of the University of Minnesota, we were taught one thing from the first day on, and that was the idea that we were gatekeepers that trust was the essential element of news unless you were an editorial writer and there was a separation between, between opinion and being a reporter, which is something which was the basis of being a good journalist. And that the thing was, was that news was the truth. You know, and what's frustrating is, is that news was and should be the explainer of complexity within the society. And we're honored to have Marvin Kalb, who has followed that dictum for, for a long time. And my only regret um, is that this is the discussion we should have around dinner. And it's the kind of discussion, Marvin, that usually we have late at night in Moscow, sitting in a kitchen yep. <laughs> with, with bread, sausage, and a bottle of vodka. <laughs> And then we get into meaning, and that's the discussion that we were in tonight. So, sir, thank you for the honor of, you know, for the honor to us, uh, to, you know, for us and to us of having the pleasure of spending time with you. And we hope we have another opportunity to do this again in the future. Thank you, thank very, you very, very much. Thank God you. And thank you to everybody else. God bless. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. You were wonderful. Thank you.